dive into our theme of, of envy slash jealousy, I want to say I don't do jealousy. I just skip right over it to another emotion like rage. <laughs> um, I can do envy all day long, but I don't. I don't. I just skip right to the outrage or um, anger. Um, and. There's something about storytelling. I, I'm a writer, and whether it's in writing or in a live venue like this, there's risk in it. And it's not risk for me exposing myself to you all. There's risk for the people in the story, too. Um, and oftentimes, the other people in our stories aren't painted in a very flattering or positive light. And uh, so for my story, I've changed the names of the players and the, the role where player fits. And uh, not to protect their innocence because they're all guilty, <laughs> um, but to respect their privacy. And uh, one other note I want to say before getting into the story is, uh, you know, if you don't want to be painted as a villain in somebody's story, don't behave like one. <laughs> My story starts 15 years ago when I moved to Oregon, and I was married at the time. We'd been together seven years, and uh, things were not going well. Our, our marriage was really struggling, and um, the move didn't help. It just stressed it further, and uh, I remember, well, the, the dynamic between us was such that whenever there was an issue or problem, and my husband would voice that, I went into a tailspin and twisted myself in knots to figure out what could I do to fix this? How can I make this work? And it was a great dynamic because he never had to do anything. <laughs> and I got to do all this heavy lifting. I was like, oh, I'm doing all the work. And uh, it didn't work. It didn't work. And I remember the exact moment that there was a paradigm shift in me. And it wasn't premeditated. I wasn't thinking about it. We were driving up 39th, heading to the Kennedy School to watch a movie. And out of the blue, right as we were passing Grant's Park, he turns to me and he says, you know, I'm so fucking miserable, and it's all your fault. Whoa. <laughs> and in that moment, this new person I had become that I didn't even know I had become turned to him and said, in these magical, super empowering words, no, actually, the reason you're so fucking miserable is because you've never taken responsibility for your happiness. That was pretty much the beginning of the end. We separated a week later and uh, started going to counseling. I let him pick the counselor. We started going to a guy I'll call Dr. B. And uh, Dr. B suggested that even though I shouldn't do all the heavy lifting in the relationship, he did suspect that if I could change the, the communication dynamic, that a, a domino effect might occur, and, and we'll call him Mark. Mark would, you know, move towards that and, um, you know, meet me halfway, maybe. So he gives me a book, it's called Nonviolent Communication. It, it's a thing. <laughs> it was developed in the 60s, it's used by mediators and uh, diplomats and, and lawyers, anybody who works with conflict in high-risk, um, highly emotional situations. And I think a marriage qualifies, right? <laughs> so I'm like, great, oh, I'm, I'm like the worker bee, I'm like, I'm going to master nonviolent communication. And I dig in, I read the book, I'm like trying to apply the principles. And um, it wasn't working, and I wasn't sure if it was because I sucked at nonviolent communication or because my ex was out having an affair. <laughs> and when he told me about the affair, um, I, did, I wasn't jealous. I was so relieved. I was so relieved because I was like, fuck, I don't have to do all this work anymore. <laughs> And it had been over for a while, and, and we just didn't know, and, or didn't want to admit it. And, um, and I thought, okay, I can, I can move forward, I don't have to, like, I'm just so relieved, I'm happy. He's, he's found somebody that can make him happy, right? And 
And so that was that, you know, it was, there was no big, we parted ways amicably and divorced a couple months later. Shortly after the divorce, I was like, all right, it's been a while since I've had any like sexy time romance action and I'm ready. And I meet a guy that I'm attracted to up at a conference in Seattle and some friends knew him. And so I asked my friend Lucy, like, hey, what do you think? Um, what's, what's Pat's situation? Is he single? And she said, no, but he's in a polyamorous relationship, so he's kind of available. And I was like, well, that kind of works, because I didn't want a relationship. I was like, I'm just looking for a good time, right? You know, I'm thinking, go back to dinner, maybe the theater, and some, some sexy time. <laughs> and uh, so I approach him, and he's receptive. And he says, okay, well, let's meet, and so we can talk about, you know, the polyamory part, because it's complicated. And I'm thinking, great, okay, whatever, you know, it's fine. Uh, the first time we meet, he brings me a copy of a book. To read. It's called The Ethical Slut. It's like the Bible of polyamory. It's required reading, it's like a, like a user's manual. So if you're thinking about maybe you want to check out the lifestyle, look it up. And, um, and I read it, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, I don't think this works for me, but I'm just going to be the secondary partner anyway, so who cares, right? And, uh, and the second time we meet, I give him back the book. I'm like, yeah, it's fine, whatever. And, and he's, he has this 10-page contract <laughs> with the rules of engagement. And it's, you know, like, I'm the secondary partner. He has the primary partner. Primary partner has veto power and all these other things. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like openness to me. This seems really controlling, actually. <laughs> but I'm like, whatever, I just want to get laid. <laughs> So I go along with it, I'm like, yeah, it's a friend. And, um, and then we hook up. Great, okay. Um, not that great, actually. So after a couple of times, I'm like, okay, I'm done. And, and I, before I could tell him that I was done, I get this call and his primary partner is freaking out. She's enraged with jealousy. And I don't know what it was. It was something or maybe everything about me and that just set her off and, and like, she told him, you can see anybody else but Uma. And I was like, I don't even know you. Like, what, 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 am I, what button am I pushing? Um, we never had any interaction. And at this point, I'm thinking, this is bullshit. Like, I came here to have like, a good time, and it's supposed to be light and you know, free, and, and it's turning into more and more drama. And my takeaway was that, um, you know, it's, intimacy is so complicated and difficult with two people. <laughs> then when you add a third and a fourth or however many people there are in this little triangle, it's really complicated and a lot more drama. So that was that. I was like, that's done, not doing that again. And a couple months later, uh, through online dating, I met the love of my life. Yay. And he was, he's tall and handsome and, you know, silver fox and, really charming and really smart and just like we had amazing sex, a lot of sex, really great conversations and we were on the same page with our values. We were both endurance riders, we did bike tours together, we played ultimate together and then we had our own you know, separate things. So it felt like this, this really perfect blend of coming together and being really enmeshed and, and then moving apart and then coming together and moving apart. And I was like, this is perfect. This is what I've always wanted. I can't believe I'm so lucky until I found out after he moved in with me that he had been seeing his ex-girlfriend on the side. I went straight from, I didn't do the jealousy thing. I, in fact, I remember my exact words very clearly. Um, they work in a lot of different situations. <laughs> I just said, dude, what the fuck? Like, why the fuck are you sabotaging this incredible relationship? Because I know that he felt the same way about me and maybe some other people. <laughs> and so, 
And he said, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, well, you have to figure it out. You have to figure out what you want. He said, well, I know what I want. I said, well, what do you want? He said, I want Jill to move in with us. <laughs> and, and we'll become a polyamorous family. <laughs> so I'm like, let me think. Um, no, <laughs> that doesn't work for me. You need to decide. And he said, I can't, I can't decide. I can't choose because I love you both. And I said, well, I don't have that problem. So I will decide, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> He did, and I fell apart. I was really, really shattered. I never had the jealousy thing. It just went straight to, what the fuck, and then get the fuck out, you know? So it was more that I was grieving. I was grieving for a long time. And I realized I was going through all those stages, the Kubler-Ross thing, like cycling through and through. And then I ended up in anger for a really long time. <laughs> And, and then, you know, it was years later when I finally peeled back the anger to see, like, I was, I really was so in love. And I, I, he was the guy, like, I had this vision that we were going to be those doddering old people in the park feeding pigeons, holding arthritic, gnarly hands, still deeply in love. And that, you know, that possibility was taken from me. And I actually said no. And... Um, I looked, I went to, I was still going to Dr. B's at the time, and uh, we looked at these, this emerging pattern, <laughs> and, d you know, discovered that, uh, hey, the uh, common denominator in all of it is me. <laughs> so I was, I became convinced that nonviolent communication was going to fix everything, and I was never going to be in this situation again. So I signed up for a workshop, and I go to the workshop, it's at a yoga studio, at a friend's place. And there are maybe 30 people there. And they, you know, we have introductions, and then they split us up into small groups to work on uh, the technique and, and, and the, the process. And it's a really simple formula. So take notes. If you want to learn nonviolent communication, here's the cliff notes. <laughs> Step number one, you say what the problem is, just plainly. What is going on that you don't like? Step number two is you say how you feel. And we do this thing in our culture where we, we have this bad habit. We say, I feel like, and then we fill in the blanks with a bunch of bullshit. And we don't actually acknowledge what we feel. Like, I feel like you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me isn't a feeling. I feel hurt. I feel abandoned. I feel angry. I feel upset. I feel elated. These are feelings. So we learn to identify our feelings. I got that part. Step number three is you, you say what you would want to have happen, a different outcome or behavior. And step number four is you ask the person if they're willing to accommodate you. So at the end of the session, the facilitator says, does anybody have any questions? And I, my hand shot up and I was like, yeah, this doesn't work for me. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, it doesn't work. Like, I, I don't know, I, I, my situation is special and it doesn't apply. <laughs> he, he says, well, are you willing to share? Can, you, can we workshop this uh, you know, for, the, for the sake of the group? And I said, sure, no problem. And I get up to the front of the room and he said, just talk to me like you're talking to the person you have conflict with. Is this, uh, who is, what is her or his name? And I said, um, his name is Sam. And he said, okay, just talk to me like I'm Sam. And I said, okay, Sam. <laughs> when I observe you cheating on me with your ex-girlfriend, I feel like you're an asshole. <laughs> what I would like is for you to stop being an asshole. So could you just fucking do that for me, please? <laughs> yoga studio with lots of yoga people, so the room was very silent for me. And then there was a really awkward, uncomfortable after, and I was told to stay after for some special tutoring. I 
I went back to Dr. B's and I was like, this isn't working. I'm making myself neurotic, twisting myself up in knots to like try to be different and not, not be authentic to myself. And, and, you know, maybe I'm not the one with the problem. You know, it's not how I say things. Maybe it's how people receive them, you know? And he said, you know, Uma, I'm so glad you are the way you are and that you say things the way you say them, and that you're direct and you take things head on, not obliquely or obtusely. There's no, you know, you don't, you don't play that game. You're just present and authentic and, and real. And sometimes realness is hard to let in. And the world needs more of that now, that ability to be real. And I said, but what about the, the part about the compassion, like the, the other name for nonviolent communication is compassionate communication. I was a 20 year yoga teacher and meditation teacher. And I'm like, what about the, the compassion part? Like I can go around telling people they're assholes. That's not compassionate, <laughs> right? And he left me with these words. It took a little while for me to uh, really let them in. But once I got them, I was like, oh, yeah. He said, you know, sometimes ruthlessness is the best form of compassion. <laughs>